uh, Acts chapter 2. We began the, the, the first part of Peter's message last week, and like I prayed, it, Peter in this, taking his stand and he's explaining this thing that has happened, really he's, he's springboarding off of the question that the people have, they're, they're wondering what's going on as the Holy Spirit has has descended and manifest himself amongst the believers. Of course, they're speaking in tongues, which no one really understands. You know, there's an interpretation. The people are understanding what they're saying, but they don't understand the whole the hoopla of it. And they, they say, oh, they're drunk. And so last week we began Peter springboarding off of that and just explaining, no, they're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. No, this is what Joel, the prophet Joel promised. This is the Holy Spirit who's come upon them. And he's come upon them in power. And, and, and we went through that whole thing. And, and now as we continue, what we see is as he continues, this is a great outline. And if you take notes, this is, this is really noteworthy. Peter's first sermon, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's a changed guy. And God gives him a perfect outline of how to share the gospel. A perfect outline of how to witness. Do you guys witness to your friends? Some of you? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we wonder, how do we do that? What are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to do? Beyond living the Christian life, which is, of course, the primary thing we do, we live as an example of Christ, but then there are opportunities that come for you to actually share. This was an opportunity for Peter as he stood up and he explained the gospel. We'll see a really wonderful, perfect outline. And, and I would say absolutely perfect outline of how to share the truth of the gospel. And so I want to begin, we're going to read verses 22 through 36 of Acts chapter 2. He says, having continued, having gone through the prophecy of Joel and talked about that, he says, verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. I always, whenever I read that, I always think of Charles Stanley. Any of you guys ever watch Charles Stanley? Now listen to me. Now listen to me, child of God. I can't really do his accent very good, but I always love the way he does that. It's, he just reminds, Listen. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You've made known to me the ways of life, and you'll make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you that regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne... He looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again, which we are all witnesses. To which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Verse 
For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is, it's, it's so miraculous, isn't it? This is Peter. This is the guy who said, no way, Lord. This is the guy who said, I don't know the man. You know, three times, he, even with swearing, I don't know him. He's the guy that Jesus rebuked and said, get behind me, Satan. He's the guy that came out with the sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest on the night when they were arresting Jesus. He's a guy who did all the goofy things. And here he is now, and it's like, boom, boom, boom. He's just going through it. He's just plowing through the gospel. It's like he just presents the whole thing. It's perfect. And you see just the difference in a life where he's given over and the Holy Spirit has just transformed him. The Holy Spirit is speaking through this guy, speaking and putting together the whole thing for the people. As we look at the way he does this, the first thing that I want to call your attention to is something that we began actually last week. The first thing that he does and that we should do when we're sharing about Christ is he employs the word of God. It is, it is the primary thing that people need to hear. Amen? And we saw that last week. What did he do? He said, hey, this thing that's happened, let me explain that to you. Now, he didn't say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit has descended. And he didn't do some kind of an intellectual kind of understanding thing. What he did is he went back to the prophet Joel. And he said, this thing that's happened, let me explain it to you using the word of God. This is the thing that God's already explained hundreds of years prior. This was going to happen. And so he uses the word of God to explain what's going on to testify about God's current work, the present work that he's doing. It's very, very important. And so here again, he does the same thing. He goes through the, the, the testimony of David. He uses the Psalm uh, 16, verses 8 through 11. Now, what does this tell you about Peter? It tells you that he knew the word of God. He had been reading, he'd been studying and that is like very important, isn't it? We have to read, we have to take in the word of God. Jesus said that when, when the Holy Spirit came, that he would bring to remembrance all that he said. There were things that were in their brains that didn't really make sense to them, but the Holy Spirit could use those things because they were in there. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit is so much bigger. He's not limited by what we know. He can speak anything he wants through us if we're yielded to him. However, if you know the word of God, it's a, it's, a, it's a wealth, it'll come out of you, amen? And so it's important for us to know the word of God and then to rely on the word of God as, as we try to share or wanna share the, the things pertaining to Jesus and the gospel. So many people uh, try to present the gospel in an intellectual way so that people could intellectually grasp it. And, and I think that's a mistake. Although, you know, it's good to have some apologetics, some good reasoning, there's nothing like the Word of God. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a few books before uh, Revelation. Second Peter chapter one, Peter later in his letter, he, he writes about his own testimony and his own eyewitness account. I love these verses, second Peter one, starting in verse 16. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, we, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. 
This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, if you remember. James and John and Peter were with Jesus when he went up on the mountain and he was changed before them. They witnessed this incredible thing where he, he took upon him the glorified state. They were able to witness this. And they heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. That's the word of God. Amen? That is the word of God. It doesn't get any more direct and any more pure than that. And, and Peter just says, you know, when we have set out to explain this whole thing to you, we haven't relied on cleverly devised tales. So many people, that's their, their thought about Christianity. Christianity, they think that this is a, 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 a series or a system or a collection of cleverly thought out tales that somehow, you know, over the ages, people put together this whole story. They haven't really investigated it enough. It's miraculous. He's, he's bringing out the word of God, saying, hey, this is what the prophet Joel wrote. This is what David wrote. And they all point to Jesus. Don't, you know, don't rely on, when you're sharing the gospel, don't rely on, on wisdom of the world or, or trying to, to, to intellectually reason with people. You know, there is a time and a place for, for those apologetic things and arguments and, and reasons and evidence of faith, but the word of God should be the primary thing that you share. It's, it's powerful. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, encouraging him, the young pastor, he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture, this thing that we hold in our hands, the word of God, it's, it's adequate, it's, it's, it's inspired by God, and it's, it's good for reproof, correction, and, and training, all these things, and of course, it's the explanation of Christ. It's the explanation of the gospel. And so it's good for us to rely on that. It's one of the reasons why this is what we do. You know, some churches, you'll get a couple verses, and then you'll get a sermon. We go through, we plow through the word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, because this is what you need, amen? This is what you need, and this is, this is why we do it. So, so back in our text, he's used the words of Joel, he's used the words of David, he points out what David prophesied of Jesus. He, you know, in verse 27 and 28, talking about um, the Messiah that would come, he's not gonna be abandoned to Hades, he's not gonna go, undergo decay. Um, and, and of course, this is prophetic. David wrote this, inspired by God. He wrote this of the Messiah that was to come. And so all here Peter is doing is using the word of God to point to Jesus, which really brings us to the second point in the outline, if there's an outline in here. Use the word of God, he uses the word of God, he relies upon the word of God. And, and the second thing, and probably the primary thing, is that he points to Jesus. This is what we need to do, right? Amen? We don't point to Calvary Chapel. We don't point to the church or, or, you know, some book. I mean, you know, there's a lot of good things out there, but we want to get people to consider Jesus Christ. We want to get people to think about Jesus. And, and you see, starting with verse 22, after he has explained this outpouring of the Holy Spirit using Joel's words, he says, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you with miracles. He, he gets them to focus on Jesus the man. He begins with that focus. He wraps it up with that focus. Verse 36. This, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. It's look at the man. And of course, he's talking to a crowd who had seen Jesus, who had seen the miracles. They'd heard the teaching. Think about how scary it would be to to speak this way to this crowd. They just killed Jesus. You know, they're not, it's not a favorable crowd, we should, could say. You know, and, and I, I love that, but he, he points them to Jesus. Um, you guys ever get the knock on your door on Saturday morning with the Colts? They knocked on our door um, this week. I, 
we didn't let him in. Um, I was still in my underwear, and uh, uh, sorry for that. If you got a, ment- a visual there, I'm sorry, or mental picture. But Lori said, oh, they're in our driveway. They actually parked in our driveway, and they found out across the neighborhood, and they came and gave her the, it was the Jehovah's Witnesses, they gave her the little pamphlet, you know, that they give out, those little um, pamphlets that are designed to, to get you to, you know, have a little trust in their, their group. And they, you know, their, their whole mission is they like to teach. And they're trained to answer questions. And, and they're trained in specific doctrinal points that they want to talk to you about. And you guys experience this? And, and there are certain things they want to talk about and there are certain things they want to avoid. You know what they want to avoid? Jesus. They do not want to talk about the person of Jesus Christ. They'll want to talk about the history of the church, want to talk about different things. They'll, they'll, they'll try using their New World Translation. That's a bad translation. They'll try to pick apart the doctrine of the Trinity, but they don't really want to talk about Jesus. And I'll give you, this is just kind of a lesson within our lesson, just kind of a couple of scriptures that you can can think about if they come to your door. Um, I heard this a long time ago from Walter Martin, and and this is what, when when I am dressed and and we let them in and, and we want to talk to them, this is where I go, because it's the identity of Jesus that's the only thing that's important. All the other doctrinal things, they're important, but it's really, what do you think about Jesus? Who is Jesus? That's what Peter goes at. But here's, here's something that I remember Walter Martin uh, did. He, he talked about this in, on the radio. And he talked about a couple of verses. The first one's in John chapter 8. I think we have slides for these. So in John chapter 8, Jesus says this. He says, he, he had been talking about Abraham, and of course, you know, the, the Jews, they, they revered Abraham and believed in Abraham. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, what is he saying? He just took on for himself preexistence. He basically says, before Abraham was born, I existed. Of course, also, who took the title I am? Not a lot of people are claiming that title. But if you remember God, when he, when he spoke to Moses in the burning bush, M- Moses said, who, who am I going to say is, is sending me? And he said, I am. I don't, I don't, you, don't, you don't need to have a name for me. I'm God. Just say I am. Jesus is taking that title for himself. And the evidence is what follows. It says, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. And so when they're there on your doorstep, you can just ask him, why would they pick up stones to throw at him? If he really wasn't God, if he wasn't claiming to be deity, why would they pick up stones to throw at him? Oh, they thought he was blaspheming. He was claiming to be God. It's a great, it's just a great text because there's no other reason for them to stone him other than blasphemy. And there's another one in John chapter 10, same, same thing. John 10, 30, 31. He says, I and the Father are one. That's heresy. So they responded to that. They picked up stones to stone him again. Why? Because in their eyes, he was blaspheming. He was clearly, in both of those scriptures, Jesus Christ was claiming to be God. And so you're kind of, you can, you can use that and it'll, it'll start a good conversation. It's really important though. Get to Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Don't, you know, don't talk about politics. Certainly don't talk about politics if, if you can avoid it or, or talk about some of the hotbed issues. I mean, those things are fun and, and they can be doorways, but you always want to get to talk about Jesus. I remember... Um, I really, you know, I've always kind of known this. For a long time I've known this, but I remember it really came home to me. Um, A few years ago, we had this guy who I I, I had known him for a long time and and really loved this guy, and, um, and he'd been coming to church, and he just wasn't making any progress. You know, he, he claimed to be a believer, and, and yet he, he was just always kind of stumbling and not really able to connect and, and it just seemed like something was missing. 
And, and I don't know, maybe you know somebody like this, and, and sometimes there are people that's like, man, I just don't really know what's going on with him because he just doesn't seem to be really connected with the Lord. Though he's coming to church and, and would call himself a Christian. One day we, had, we were having a, a counseling session out in the parking lot in his car, and I remember it was just this really emotional time, and, and, and he was just really struggling because he didn't feel like he was getting it. And so I just interviewed him, and I said, well, just tell me about your faith. Tell me what you believe, because I was trying to make sure he was a Christian. And as he talked, he told me how he, you know, I, I love God, and I, I want to follow God, and I, you know, he on and on, on, he told me all about what he believed about God. And it dawned on me, in the middle of our conversation, he never mentioned Jesus. And I thought, this is so weird that he could talk all about God and never mention Christ. And I, I, I just felt like the Lord just showed me this is where to go. This is what he needs to do. And I looked at him and I said, dude, I said, I don't know if you're a Christian. Because you talk about God in terms of kind of a generic God. You know what, people, people will talk about God in a generic sense all the time. You can talk about a generic God with people and they don't get offended. You know? God bless you and different things. You know, some people get offended, but they'll get offended about just about anything. You know, they get offended if you have a Christmas tree, you know. But, but, but people will talk about a generic God, but when you identify God, when you talk about Jesus, all of a sudden Jesus, man, he, he offends people. It's like, oh yeah, you're one of them. That's right. And I told this guy, I said, you know, you need to deal with Jesus. The, the God that you're believing in is kind of just a generic God, but you haven't really identified him. You haven't actually done business with Jesus Christ. The scripture says he's the one with whom we have to do. That there's no other name given amongst men, that under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's God. And I sent this guy away. I said, you, you know, I want you to, to talk to Jesus. You need to pray, ask Jesus to forgive you. And you know what? It, it, it changed his life. He, 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 started, he was crying the whole time anyway. It was a very tender, emotional thing. But it was like he went away. And then later he came back to me and says, that was it. I just needed Jesus. I just needed to acknowledge Jesus. That's the point. You want to bring people to a place where they confront the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what Peter did in, 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 you know, in spades. <laughs> you know, this Jesus whom you crucified, he, he, he does, you know, he, he push, pushes them or shows them the Lord Jesus. And of course, in, in you know, he's, he's talking about the miracles that they witnessed and all of this. This is all part of, you know, they had seen all these things, and so he's making it all clear, this Jesus whom God talked about beforehand by the prophets. And then he, he does um, something that I think is, again, all of these things are really important. You want to speak the word of God. You want to always bring it to Jesus. But then the kind of the more tricky thing is to talk about sin. <laughs> Have you found this to be kind of tricky? Sometimes people don't really like this. Um, they want to come to Jesus, but they want to come um, on their own terms, and, and, and they want to come thinking that they're actually good people or, or that they somehow deserve God's love. Sin, he presents sin as the problem in both verse 23 and 26. Again, you nailed him to a cross whom you crucified. Now, he's speaking to a mixed crowd. He's speaking to the religious leaders who, of course, they plotted the whole thing. They're guilty. They don't have a conscience, but if they had a conscience, certainly they're guilty. They planned this. But the people, and you might think, well, the people, you know, they didn't really have a lot to do with it. But we read earlier where the, the people were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. They even shouted out, someone shouted out, his blood be upon our heads and our children. And again, the crowd, it's like, think about this. Peter is preaching this message to a crowd that just had Jesus killed. Not a, not a favorable crowd. And yet, he pushes buttons. 
he reminds them of their sin. It's always a, 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 a difficulty to figure out when you're sharing with somebody whether or not you want to preach repentance or God's love, right? It's like people need to hear both, but there are times when one is more appropriate than the other. This crowd is a proud crowd. They're, they're a crowd that's, you know, they've been against Christ, and they need to be shown that what they've done, what they've participated in, was great evil. I was talking to a guy the other day, a dear, precious friend of mine, who, I like to use Kathy Bailey's term, he's pre-Christian. He hasn't put his faith in Christ yet, but I've been working on this guy for almost 20 years. And, and over the years, he's got little parts and pieces. His wife's a believer and he's not, and he's heard a little bit and, you know, I just kind of share a little bit and dial it back and share a little bit and dial it back. And anyway, I had him on the phone and he, he began to tell me his current situation is one where he's really broken. He's had some pretty big failure. And, you know, I was like, as he was telling me kind of his more recent story and, and all this, it was, it, I could tell it was very emotional for him. Now, this was not the time for me to say, well, you know, dude, you need to repent. You know, it, it wasn't that time. It wasn't time for that because he was already broken. He was already feeling like, you know, I need help. And so what he needed to hear was, you know what? Dude, God is for you. The Lord wants to help you. Now's the time for you to just turn to him. He needed to hear the message of grace. You know, there is a time for preaching the kind of fiery message that Peter preached. And, and we ought to be ready and we ought to be fearless with it. People need to repent. Amen? People need to turn from their sins and embrace and receive Christ. They need to ask for forgiveness. And you have to determine the individual that you're talking to. Sometimes that needs to be pushed and other times the love of God needs to be pushed. Both are the gospel. And they're not mutually exclusive. They go together. As he says, you know, he's, he, he's pressing them. He's going to press them to receive Christ, to put their faith in Christ. That's the, the good part. But he, he doesn't hold back from the idea that they are going to need to repent because they've just been involved in great, great sin, having Jesus killed. James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5 um, says this, hopefully this verse is in your brain, it should be in your brain, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud. If you ever wonder, is God against me? If you're proud, he is dead set against you. You, you have just become an enemy of God. The minute you are proud, the minute you are trusting in yourselves or thinking you're all that, that is antichrist. That is against God. But for the humble, he gives grace. So that's where we always want to stay. We want to stay in that place of humility. People have trouble with this. People have trouble when you remind them or show them that they're sinners in need of a savior. I remember years ago um, having a very heated discussion with a, a lady who had taken our statement of faith to task. Calvary, uh, for years, Calvary Chapel has published kind of a, a boilerplate um, list of doctrines that we hold to, and, and one of the lines that we had copied and had on our website, and I think we used to have it in our bulletin at Calvary Chapel, was, it says, we believe that mankind is sinful at war with God, deserving penalty. We believe that. Well, she did not like that, and she wanted to give me an earful about that. That is not right. I am not at war with God. I have never been at war with God. And she wanted just, oh, you know, sometimes you get these calls and people just want to give you their opinion. And anyway, I, you know, I, I tried to explain it to her, but it was very, very difficult because she had, had trouble seeing herself as a sinner. She had trouble seeing herself as someone who was an enemy or former enemy of God. And I want to just go through a, just a, a, a quick um, few scriptures here. Romans 5.10. And this is, these are the things that I brought to her attention. And some of you will know these, but it's important. It's an important part of the gospel. He says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The idea there that we're, we were enemies. You know, and I was able to explain to her, well, it says we were at war with God. We were his enemies. 
And even though you, you might not think of yourself as an enemy of God, before Christ you were. You were sinful. Jeremiah 17, 9. Actually, oh, I'm sorry, Colossians 1.21. He says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. There's a pretty good explanation of our lives prior to Christ, right? Now, for people, some of you guys that were raised in the church and before you actually received Christ, you probably were a lot better than somebody like I was. When I read something like that, it's like, man, I identify with that. I was alienated, I was hostile in mind, I was engaged in evil deeds. Yeah, some of you are shaking your heads, you know. And whether that's evil deeds, you know, of a grand scale or even small scale, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're enemies with God, even if you're just proud, even if you're just trusting in yourselves. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's pretty clear. Paul said the wages of sin is death. There's, there's this idea that we need to understand we're sick, we're, we're, we're sinners. We need a savior. In the presentation of the gospel, you, you wanna use the word of God. You wanna bring people to face Jesus and explain Jesus. But it's also important that they understand that they're sinners in need of a savior. Without a recognition of sin, without a recognition of, of spiritual failure, who needs a savior, right? You don't need a savior if you're not in sin, if you're not a sinner. And so, that, you know, that's a really important thing. For me personally, I, I feel like um, in my life, in, in my testimony, I didn't really need anyone to tell me that. I needed, I was at one of those places, I was low, like my buddy that I was talking to on the phone. I was low, I was needy. I, I had taken sin far enough to recognize, dude, this ain't working. Some of you know what that feels like. You take it so far and it's like, man, I, I, this is not happening. And when you find somebody who's at that place, they need to hear about the grace of God. They need to hear about the love of God that will forgive them for those sins, that's gonna deliver them. And of course, Peter, he puts all of that in his message, but he, he doesn't, you know, you nailed him to a cross, and in, you know, verse 36, uh, uh, this Jesus whom you crucified, he doesn't hold back and he gives it to him full force. You guys were involved in this, the crucifixion, the, the killing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. So the word of God directing them to Jesus, making sure that there's a conviction of sins, and then he presents the risen Savior as the hope. Going back to what he said here, pointing to David's testimony. The, you know, the reason why he brought out you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the reason why he brought out this Psalm 16, verses eight through 11, in verses, that's verses 25 through 28, is so that they would see that, that David, even long ago, hundreds and hundreds of years before, he was looking for a risen savior. He was looking for this one, as verse 27 explains, someone who, whose soul wouldn't be abandoned to Hades, someone whose body wouldn't undergo decay. And so Peter, he points to the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which he says, this is what we are witness, verse 32, God raised him up again, to which we are all witnesses. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm looking forward to being able to present this again on Easter Sunday. It's, it's you know, it's critically important. Paul, as he explains it in 1 Corinthians 15, he makes the resurrection really the crux of the whole issue. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity and Jesus Christ is not God, right? Because he claimed to be God. And he said these things like, destroy this temple and in three days I'm gonna raise it up. You know, this is the most important event. And so Paul, he talks about that, 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 12, he says, now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all, we are of all men most to be pitied. He just, he just boils it down to that one issue. Either Jesus is raised or he's not raised. If he's not raised, then this whole thing is foolishness. We're still in our sins and really... There's no hope. You know, Bill watched his father pass yesterday. And and I know it was difficult, but it was glorious. And those of you who've, who've watched members of your family pass, every one of us is going to pass. Every one of us is going to die. And yet, we have this great hope. And the hope is founded on the resurrection of Christ. Because if Christ isn't raised, there isn't any hope, right? Maybe some other philosophy gives us some answers that will make us feel good. But at the end of the day, those answers don't cut it. No, what we have is a hope that's actually sure. Peter says, I think it was Peter that said, we have the the hope of the... uh, the word of the prophet, the prophecy made more sure because of the testimony. It's like the prophets talked about this, but then they actually saw it, they actually witnessed it. And he's given it to us. His testimony, his eyewitness account, as he says. And it's something to which we can be sure. The hope of the gospel, the risen savior. The Holy Spirit is using all that he says here, bringing it kind of to a head as he goes through this whole thing, telling the story, explaining, using the word of God, not you know, letting them off with their sin and, and talking about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit puts it all together. I, I don't know if you think about this, but I, I wanna give you this thought that, that I always have when I'm sharing. And that is that the Holy Spirit is the evangelist. I don't know if you believe that or, or, or understand that, but this is God's work to explain the gospel and to draw people to himself. It's his work. Jesus said when, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's gonna convict the world concerning, concerning sin and righteousness. He, he's gonna do this work. We're only partners with him. Peter is just a, he's a willing partner. It's like he's just standing there, opening his mouth, and the Lord is just speaking through him. This is God's work. And and you see the result of it when the Holy Spirit's at work using him. It comes to this place, after having this great explanation, he comes to verse 37, and it says, when they had heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? That is, that is an evangelist dream. What do we do? You've given us all this information. You've pointed to Jesus. We're looking at Jesus. We're convicted of our sins. We know that we've done something terribly wrong. What do we do? That's the point of any great gospel message is to bring somebody to the place where they gotta take some action. I've gotta do something. I have to do something with all the information that I've come in and the Holy Spirit is pressing them. Peter said to them, verse 38, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. It's crazy. 
This is, the, this is the birth of the church. We just read the birth of the church. These 120 guys gathered together in, in the upper room or wherever they were gathered together, the Holy, they're waiting on Christ. They're waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. Peter preaches this message explaining what has just happened. And, and he points to Christ and he brings them to this place. 3,000 of them just said, sign me up. You know, you notice there weren't a lot of arguments. People didn't have objections. They didn't, you know, have editorials where they wanted to take it to task. People, everyone, had, they knew what had gone on. They knew this guy was innocent. They heard about the miracles. Thousands and thousands of people had witnessed these miracles. There was really no argument about all that. They just needed the Holy Spirit to press them and to use the word of God to show them Jesus, this Jesus whom you've crucified. God has made him both Lord and Christ. And here's all you gotta do, turn around. Could you imagine being there in the presence, feeling like, you know what, I was one of those guys who cried out, crucify him. Or maybe one of the Roman guards who was there, who, you know, had hit him, had whipped him, had, you know, driven the nails into his hands. Could you imagine the feeling you'd have when all of a sudden you realize, what? He was God? He was God in the flesh and I did that? And then to have somebody say, hey, you know what? You can be forgiven right now. All you got to do is repent. That's part of the message. That is an important part of the gospel message. It's when, it's when the Holy Spirit, through the preacher, presses you to turn. Turn from your ways. Turn from, turn from your own ways. Turn from your self-reliance. Turn from your religion. Turn from your rejection. And embrace Christ. You remember we talked a few weeks ago about the thief on the cross who had been one minute, he was hurling abuse at Christ, and the next minute it was just like, the light went on and just said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't, he didn't have time to do a lot of stuff. He didn't have time to get his life together or anything like that. It's not required. What's required, though, is repentance. It's like my buddy that I talked to, you know, about in the car that he needed to deal, deal with Jesus. He needed to turn to Jesus. This guy that I was talking to on the phone this week, it's like, all you got to do is turn to Jesus. Jesus will hear you. He'll receive you. And as Peter said, he turned to him, he encourages him, repent, be baptized. Of course, baptism, it's, it's a public testimony. Paul says we ought to confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and so if you're a believer, if you're a new believer, you should get baptized. And, and I would just say, if you are a new believer and you want to get baptized, the scripture tells us to be baptized. If you want to do that, we'll rent a pool if it's cold. But I love baptisms. And we want to do that. It's a time for you to publicly testify that something spiritual has gone on in your life and you're now a follower of Jesus Christ. And so he's just saying, you need to do that. It's the word baptism it means to be placed into. They're, they're repenting, being placed into the body in relationship with Christ and with all these other believers. And he just says, you're going to receive the forgiveness of sins. I don't know how people reject this. All of us who are believers, we know, oh man, it is so glorious when you have that weight, that burden taken off of you for the first time and you realize, I am forgiven, I'm clean. And so he brings them to that place. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> it's such a glorious message. It's so fun to tell. We're gonna have communion. And I can think of just no other, no better presentation to have before communion. The, uh, in the communion, we simply remember. It's a, it's a time of remembering what Christ did for us. The, his body symbolized in the little matzah cracker that we have. Even the cracker itself, it's pierced. It's, it's symbolic of Jesus' body that was broken for us. And then we, we have the juice, which is symbolic of his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. We're gonna have those passed out and we're gonna take them together. I wanna encourage you, if you've never put your faith in Christ, today's the day. We just, we just went through the whole thing. 
All you gotta do is repent. All you gotta do is ask for forgiveness and receive the Lord Jesus. And I encourage you to do that today. And certainly for all of us, we just remember what the Lord did. Amen.